Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, and it's a big one. SpaceX is rapidly approaching readiness for Starship Flight 7, having now completed static fire testing of both Booster 14 and Ship 33, while still managing to launch 22 more Starlink satellites to orbit aboard Falcon 9. China also launched their high-speed laser Diamond Constellation experimental system, Rocket Lab launched a very secretive hypersonic electron mission, Artemis II's SLS core stage went vertical, while its Orion capsule returned to the final assembly and test cell, the first ever wooden satellite was deployed from the Japanese experiment module on the ISS, and much, much, much more. Enjoy. This is Super Heavy Booster 14, conducting a recent static fire test last Monday. It'll be the vehicle that launches Starship on its seventh flight test, hopefully giving us another spectacular launch and tower catch like we saw with Flight 5. SpaceX are still hoping to launch this from Texas in the early morning hours of January the 11th, which is now less than four weeks away if you can believe it. The day after the static fire, the booster was lifted off the orbital launch mount, but not just to a sensible transfer to transporter height, it was lifted all the way to the top of the tower, which is the height at which it will be caught if everything goes to plan. After this, it was lowered down and placed on the booster transporter, which then carried it back to the production area, where it will undergo final pre-flight checkout and have its hot stage ring installed ready for Flight 7. The upper stage for Flight 7 will be Ship 33, the first ever Block 2 starship, and it too is rapidly approaching launch readiness. Activity around this vehicle began on Wednesday, when the mobile static fire stand was spotted being relocated to Mega Bay 2, where Ship 33 was subsequently placed on it. The stack was then rolled out, giving us a great view of the vehicle's heat shield, and the whole thing was transported to Massey's to begin its test campaign. It had already completed cryo-testing back in October, meaning that this stay at the test site would be for static fire testing. First up though would be spin prime testing, which is almost the same as static fire, but the engines aren't ignited, instead they're just spun up, hence the name spin prime. This was on Thursday, during nighttime hours so it is kind of hard to see, but if you squint and really zoom in, you can just about see the white plume at the base of the vehicle indicating the spin prime test. While significant, spin primes just don't hit the same way that static fires do. But luckily, we wouldn't have to wait too long to see one of those. Further testing commenced on Sunday, with propellant loading indicated by ice formation on the ship's fuselage, and then, there we go! Static fire of the Flight 7 Starship. Now that both vehicles have completed their static fire campaigns, there's not much left to do other than full stack and launch. Vehicle testing aside, we saw some progress take place at the orbital launch site last week. Wednesday saw the lift and placement of a new liquid methane tank, which was then followed by the lift and placement of another new tank on Thursday. The tank thrills didn't end there. Friday saw the delivery of a new vertical tank, which was swiftly lifted and mounted, and this was then followed by the lift and placement of a second vertical tank. In preparation for Flight 7, the orbital launch mount has been swarmed by workers and cherry pickers as teams prepare things for Booster 14's launch, and the chopsticks underwent testing in anticipation for the flight's catch attempt. On Wednesday, we saw them fully open up while also simultaneously rising to the top of the orbital launch and catch tower. Once at full height, we then saw several chopstick closure tests, testing the system's ability to quickly align with a hypothetical landing booster footage here courtesy of NASA Spaceflight's Starbase livestream. Speaking of, the stream also captured the transfer of Ship 35's forward section being moved from the high bay into the Star Factory building. And speaking of that, we finally saw the completion of this building's external panelling. I was surprised that this has only just happened, to be honest, considering how active this building now is, but great to see nonetheless. SpaceX's Falcon 9 had a somewhat uncharacteristically quiet week, with only one orbital launch taking place. This happened on Friday the 13th and was a pretty run-of-the-mill Starlink mission, lifting off from California's Vandenberg Space Force Base, carrying 22 Starlink satellites to Shell 11 on SpaceX's 125th mission of the year. What an insane number. <laughs> After stage separation, the rocket's first stage made a successful landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean, completing this booster's ninth overall flight and SpaceX's 100th drone ship landing of the year. We saw two Chinese orbital launches last week, starting on Thursday. 
A Long March 2D rocket carried five payloads into space as part of China's High Speed Laser Diamond Constellation Experimental System mission. Not much was really shared about what this experimental system is, but it seems likely that the mission will test inter-satellite laser links to facilitate China's ongoing efforts with its major constellation projects. People still sometimes ask what that stuff falling off the fairings of Chinese rockets is. They're just the thermal insulation tiles, which we generally always see on Chinese rockets, especially during the colder months. Earlier today, we saw a Long March 5B launch with the YZ-2 upper stage, the first time we've seen this configuration, carrying a batch of 54 communication satellites for the state-owned SatNet constellation, operated by the China Satellite Network Group that will eventually consist of 13,000 satellites. Rocket Lab conducted a rather mysterious electron launch on Saturday, so mysterious in fact that they didn't share any footage or video, or even announce the thing on any of their social medias or YouTube. So I'll just use a previous launch as footage here for illustrative purposes. This was a HASTE variant of Electron, which is an acronym that stands for Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron. And as the name suggests, this variant of Electron launches payloads on a suborbital trajectory, and last week's launch carried the Stonehenge payload for LIDOS, an American defense firm, and the payload's exact nature hasn't been disclosed. Because of this, and the overall lack of fanfare around this launch, it means that the payload was probably a classified bit of hardware to test technologies for the US military. Before we carry on with space news stuff, I'm just shoehorning in this little heads up. There's probably not going to be a Space This Week episode next week, or likely the week after. It's the holiday season, and I'm probably going to be too busy visiting family to be able to have enough time to make a Space News video, sadly. Kerbal Space Program content should be unaffected since I can make those videos in advance, but for obvious reasons I can't do the same for Space News videos. I hope you can understand. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's move on to last Wednesday. NASA's Exploration Ground Systems teams transported and lowered the massive 65-meter-tall Space Launch System core stage into High Bay 2 at the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center, which will power the Artemis II mission to the moon. This was achieved using a one-of-a-kind lifting beam, and the core will remain there while teams assemble the two solid rocket boosters either side atop Mobile Launcher 1, completing the stacking process for the SLS SRBs, a process that has already begun, with the left aft assembly being stacked on top of Mobile Launcher 1, on the 19th of November. On the subject of Artemis 2, its Orion capsule was recently lifted out of the vacuum chamber in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at Kennedy Space Center, having completed critical vacuum testing to simulate space conditions. It has been returned to the final assembly and test cell as NASA prepares to launch the first humans to lunar orbit since Apollo 17 in 1972. During their extended stay aboard the International Space Station, NASA astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore have been focused on two Astro B investigations aboard the station. Station Commander Sonny Williams worked with ground teams on Astro B Reach, testing technology that will hopefully one day facilitate the capture of space objects of various shapes and materials while studying interactions between free floating objects. This research aims to improve orbital object capture, extending satellite lifespans, and protecting assets and infrastructure in low Earth orbit. Meanwhile, Butch Wilmore aided the Klingers investigation, using Astro B robots to test an adapter for docking and close approach sensing with active and passive objects. This work could enable satellite servicing, orbital refueling, spacecraft repairs, and in orbit manufacturing. Last Monday saw the deployment of the first ever wooden satellite, which was released from the Japanese experiment module's small satellite orbital deployer as part of an ongoing study to investigate the validity of wood as a suitable material for satellite construction. Measuring 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, the satellite, called Lignosat, was developed by Kyoto University and logging firm Sumitomo Forestry and was assembled using traditional Japanese techniques without screws or glue. With the satellite now deployed, researchers will begin analyzing the temperature and strain on its wooden materials to understand how they are affected by the vacuum, atomic oxygen, and radiation in space. Laon Aerospace had another busy week last week. I decided to dust off the old Blunderbird's cap and rescue a fellow player who had managed to accidentally strand 10 Kerbals at the Mun, seven aboard a crashed lander, and three aboard a space station with the catch being that some of the Kerbals couldn't EVA on account of being tourists, which led to some rather creative decisions when it came to designing a rescue vehicle. 
If that sounds like a good time, then it should now be one of the clickable cards on screen. There's also another video from my channel there, as well as the names of my Patreon and YouTube channel supporters. If you want to support Space this week, then do consider signing up. I always very, very much appreciate it. But other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. It's going to be a KSP video on Saturday. I forgot what day I upload. It's a Space Shuttle Challenge. It's going to be 